Good morning. How are we doing today? My name is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit. Welcome back to another video. Today I'm joined by Chris Warren. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, James. How are you? Excellent. Today I want to talk through a fun hand that was shared on the Red Chip Poker forums, and I figure let's kind of get to the interesting spot, and then we're playing in reverse and start running this through through street by street. That work for you? Sounds good. Excellent. All right. So the actual hand itself is this. There's a min raise from under the gun playing 10 limit six max. Here decides to three bet from the cutoff with ace five suited. Early position calls, flops in over and flush draw. Here decides to go half pot, gets called. Turn pairs the board, check. Here decides to continue firing. Early position calls again. River is the king. Early position checks and here decides to bomb it. So let's start back from the beginning, kind of keep this in the back of your head as to what you might be doing in this situation. But Chris, let's you and I start with the min raise and then here decides to three bet from the cutoff with ace five suited to 60 cents. So three X, what are your initial thoughts here? Yeah, I think this is pretty much the standard play. Uh, I don't think that I would do anything different, honestly, personally. Um, I tend to just have ace five suited as a pure three bet if I'm going with a simplified three bet range. And uh, yeah, I think most people will do that. So all looking clear to me. Cool, looks all good to me. No stress whatsoever. I think if you are uncomfortable, folding here is kind of the more the default play, but as you're looking to expand your three bet range, a combination like ace five suited or ace four suited, not throwing in every single suited ace x hand by any stretch, but ones like this every now and then can be very, very good for your overall three betting strategy. Yeah, we, we don't want to be calling, I would say. Uh, it would be an important thing that I think a lot of people would do here. Um, if you think you should call, just go ahead and three bet. And uh, if you, um, yeah, if you think you can call, you should be three betting. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally on board with that. Early position calls, okay, no problem. It's going to happen some percentage of the time. Early position checks the flop and here decides to fire for half pot. At this point, would you do anything else or is this pretty typical default standard for you? Yeah, I think we all know that, you know, getting the flusher on the flop, we have a couple interesting backdoors. Everything's looking good here. Um, the only thing to note, I would say, is that, like, I guess our opponents could uh, more plausibly have uh, things like threes, maybe pocket sevens more often than us. So we're maybe at a slight disadvantage there um, from a nut advantage, but from a range advantage, you know, we have all the over pairs. Um, we could probably still, have, we should definitely still have nines in our three bet range here. Um, so yeah i mean it's and, and then the weird hands like i think you know like a nine seven suited or something we both could probably have that the same amount plausibly you know for playing our tight gto ranges we won't um but similarly our opponents playing tight they wouldn't have that really either so um yeah pretty uh pretty even ish flop with just our basic range advantage as the three better Totally fine with this. I can't really see sizing it too, too much differently. I mean, maybe we could go down just a pinch, but I think half a pot looks pretty standard here. Would you ever size down? I know we talk a lot about kind of looking for spots to bet like quarter pot or third pot. Is this kind of one of those good situations for it or, or not so much? I would say no. Uh, I like half pot or even a little bit bigger in this scenario just because it's it's not a heavily ranged uh, range or nut advantaged uh towards one person or the other. So uh, a more standard half pot to maybe 65% uh, is, is about what, we, what I do and, and half pot looks great. Cool, no problem with that. So early position decides to call, turn pairs the board with the seven, early position checks and here decides to fire for a buck 69. So give or take around what, two thirds ish pot. Thoughts at this stage in the game, because I think this is one where we really have to start making some decisions and kind of thinking about, okay, do I have interest in barreling this off for three streets? And not that we automatically have to every single time that we barrel on this turn, but I think we really have to start thinking about how big of a pot do we want to create here? Is this a spot where we should just check back, take it for cheap or start looking at the barrel and possibly go for all three. So what are you kind of thinking in this situation? Yeah, so again, I'm just going to go and analyze my my nut advantage and my range advantage real quick. Um, we still have the range advantage, I would say, on average with all the over pairs that they should have, you know, four bet. Uh, so that's in our favor. Uh, the seven is actually kind of, I think, favorable 
in a way for us because now all of these pocket sevens that they would almost certainly had 100 percent pure in their range and we probably shouldn't have as much in our three bit range um those are now blocked essentially like they can of course have quads but it didn't really change the it reduces the amount of combos that they can have of that so that's nice for us um similarly the nine seven the eight seven suited sec, uh, seven sex suited type hands um it is uh probably i would assume more favorable for the under the gun average small stakes player like they're going to have eight seven suited seven six suited probably 100 percent of the time um if they're taking these types of lines uh maybe not maybe they have an open lamp or whatever but we just can't know that type of thing so um i, I could give them credit for having like the logical 7x suited connectors um, more than us however i don't think an opponent will necessarily assume that's true so basically unless they have it like they i think that we give them credit for maybe having something near pure 7x combos in their range uh for uh, a, a suited no gapper connector um but i don't think we necessarily don't get credit for having these even though like we probably should have it uh, at a reduced frequency if we're using an optimal gp gto range here um but that said our hand is very strong it's definitely in the category that we want to barrel there's a lot of appealing hands to push off with things like jack 10 uh, probably uh yeah just some like gut shot or broadway hands that almost certainly would have taken the line pre-flop and floated on the flop um even things like with back doors like just like queen 10 king 10 ace 10 a lot of these hands probably would have floated um notably the back door flush red did come in so if they were floating with something like ace jack with the with the spade you know they're now continuing more maybe check raising us more so very interesting very dynamic turn that we have to account for a lot of variables and i just kind of went over everything that i look at um the, all that taken in what do you where do you kind of sit with it james so i guess i try i probably build the flop calling range from early position a little bit tighter i don't think i put in quite as much of the double broadway stuff unless it has diamonds on it or spades on it mm -hmm. or is more connected in the straight like you know jack 10 obviously fits the bill and jack 10 diamonds jack 10 spades is totally standard but i think i get a little bit more weary about like throwing all of the queen tens i don't think i throwing queen 10 of hearts every single time mm. depends who early position is but we weren't really given any any specific information on them in this spot so i'm looking at a range that has you know single pairs a decent chunk of the time some draws i'm also very curious on whether or not they're going to check raise those draws right this moment and i think that starts to become more and more important to consider as you're playing against more and more aggressive opponents or in more aggressive limits if maybe this uh, you know 10 to limit i don't think is going to be the most aggressive limit in the world but as you move higher and higher you have to be aware of that check raise dynamic yeah i, I don't know i think this is one of those where I probably check some percentage of the time i could see information leaning me more towards checking but i think as, as a barrel opportunity i think this is pretty darn good i'm not mad at all like you said we have all the over pairs working for us in our favor our opponent can have some monster hands but there's one not that many of them just from a combo perspective and when they're sitting here with pocket eights, pocket tens, pocket jacks, you know, I'm assuming they probably four bet with kings plus preflop, maybe queens plus, but I, I don't know. I think I want to put those hands in hell, and I think by betting here, you can take advantage of either the turn size or the river, depending on exactly what that card is. And a buck sixty nine, I think, is one of those like default sizes, but. I think a little bit larger is going to go a lot further, if nothing else, because then the river doesn't have to be an overbet versus if we go 169, it does have to be an overbet on the river. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not 100% sold on the exact size that I use in this spot. What, what are you thinking with kind of all this being talked out? Yeah, and I think it's important to recognize that this is a, this is a very close spot, and it's actually a pretty complicated spot. Um, if I were to add everything up in my head, I, I just look at that flop and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to check back a little bit more on that flop. It's not a, a flop that I'm going to bet as much, which is why we bet larger. Therefore, my range is a bit tighter going to the turn. Um, 
and I'm going to be incentivized to bet larger with my hands. And I think even just looking at the obvious continue hands, like you said, with, you know, maybe tens through queens, some percentage, um, tens pure, jacks probably pure, queens maybe 50 50, who knows? Um, you know, we can probably put those hands in a very uncomfortable position uh, by overbetting. And that's kind of the logical way to bluff. And this is a pretty good hand to do so. So if I, I think if I, I, I would check here a good percentage. And I think the way I tend to balance out here is that I would do some randomization and I would uh, check uh, 60%, bet 40%. And I'd lean my, I'd lean my bets towards kind of over betting pretty large, maybe four to 450. Um, I'm a hundred percent committed at that point. If they, you know, just decide to stack off with tens, you know, I have to call and realize my equity on flush draw plus over card. And, um, you know, maybe for some reason they, they stack their flush draw. Uh, we may even get them to fold some flush draws, which, uh, isn't a bad scenario. I don't think. Whereas, you know, we may have like bet small gotten check raised off our flush draw. Um, and yeah, we're stacking against seven X, but as James said, like it isn't, I don't think we account for it being just pure seven X. Like they have tons of seven X combos. It's just is what it is. Um, so yeah, I, I would lean balanced here and just kind of, if I'm going to bluff, I'm going to bluff about 25 to 40% uh, of the time. And then I like just kind of a overbet committal size where it's like, yeah, like I'm not folding. <laughs> if you want to stack off, you can stack off. Uh, I think the only downside of that is, as you said, um, potentially we could put more pressure on some of those over pairs on some of the rivers. Um, just, you know, someone stacking off tens here isn't that uncomfortable, right? Like if they think you're tight, it's obviously like concerning, <laughs> you know, you're certainly not happy about it, but like, it's not like an uncomfortable, it's not like there's so many combinations that beat tens here other than just pure over pairs. So um, they'll be good against our bluffs if they feel like we're bluffing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just take a def my standard defensive balance line and, and bluff some percentage and, and do so with the size I want to bet my whole range. And, you know, similarly with aces, it's not a bad way to play aces to be overbetting. So, you know, me, I like I like to play my whole range and uh, overbet seems like a really nice size here. And yeah, the only thing I think we lose out with the overbet size is that our over pairs don't get to charge flush draws as much. So maybe we could tune it down a lot, a little bit with that logic. It's tricky to say. Um, it's, it's, it's a complex, it's a complex turn scenario, I think is, is what we're outlining here and, um, simple, simplified, you know, you're going to have to bluff some percentage of the time and you should be losing, using a larger size to make that bluff. Yeah. I like that. And I guess as I'm trying to think it out even further, like if, if we're going to just to say four bucks in the situation, instead of a buck six, nine, if we do that, in our opponent, do we think our opponent's more likely to call with tens or jam with tens? We'll just say like tens and jacks are like roughly the same hand, because uh, I think functionally most people will treat them fairly similarly. Hmm. More yeah. likely to, that they check call and then try. I don't know if they think they're inducing on the river, but I think they're more likely to check call, right? I think it happens some percentage, and that's a pretty nice percentage for us if they just don't commit us. Um, right. I think it. A lot of players will commit here, but yeah, I think just leaving that option open is interesting. Right, because I think one of my issues here is like, okay, let's just say we go a buck six nine, and our opponent does decide to just check call here with tens, jacks, whatever. I don't have a ton of overcards that are going to apply that much pressure that really want those overcards to fold. So I think I'm kind of like yeah. losing my ability to go two thirds ish here and then pile on the river, and then what other bet size am I going to use with ace five on the river? Again, assuming we go buck six, nine, they call, I don't know. I, I think I kind of, you kind of talked me into to liking the overbet. I mean, it's, it's really, really pretty. Yeah. I think I'd probably struggle finding it in real time perfectly. I think I'd go large, yeah. but I don't think I'd, I'd find $4 in real time, but that's why we study these things off table. So that way it's, it's easier to, to get there or at least get closer to the ballpark. But yeah, it's an interesting one. And I think this is a good good situation to point out is that, you know, when you get in these three bet pots, you know, it was like almost a non-hand until we got to this turn. It was like, you know, yeah, yeah we see bet the flop and we three bet pre-flop. Like these are almost non-decisions. Uh, the turn got really complicated real fast and you do have to make those decisions in the moment. So yep. yeah, just 
always always try and get there as quick as you can. I think a lot of people will maybe not make the the over bet or the large bet on this turn. So, and yeah. as, as played, I think they didn't. So, yep, exactly right. So I guess let's let's follow the the line all the way through. So early position does decide to check call the buck six nine king of hearts on the river. They check here decides to go for the bomber. So I guess I'll start this street off. So this is really really dependent on whether or not we can get tens jacks and whatever amount of like queens kind of hands to fold so i ran this one through fobzilla just to kind of run it through and the range i assigned for villain was essentially like sevens through queens and obviously the sevens and nines are blocked out because the actual uh, board itself and then when we're looking at things like the broadways we're looking at king queen but these are like rare combos because it's of diamonds and king jack of diamonds and queen jack of diamonds the only one that has both diamonds and spades is jack 10 and when we're looking at that and chopping it through and we assume our opponent's only going to continue with like the top pair plus well they only have that like 18 percent of the time so they're folding a ton in which case yeah the overbet in this situation is like such a slam dunk it's not even funny but as soon as we think they're going to continue with tens plus well, now all of a sudden it's not a great situation for us. Now we're getting folds 29% of the time. No, we're close to good with our overbet right this moment. So it, it what the reason why I like to do this kind of exploration is to find out like where that cut point in the range is. And in this situation, the cut point is squarely through those second pair hands. The more of them we think they fold, better and better this gets. But the less we think they fold, the worse and worse this gets quite quickly. And... I don't know. That's just kind of like the analytical part of this exact spot, but I'm not massively in love with it. I think it will work some percentage of the time, but I don't know. I think that once someone gets here with like Queens, Jacks, Tens, I think they're going to check call it a really good chunk of the time. I don't think that they're going to be folding as much as I'd like them to in this scenario, even though the King should be a scary card. It's also one of those cards that says, Hey, bluff me. And mm. I don't know, I could see someone at 10 and L just getting like super sticky in this situation. Uh, what are you thinking? Yeah, uh, I think you, the analysis is exactly where you want to be. And what I do is that when I have that type of analysis, I try and figure out, okay, what is the balanced play? And so, you know, what hands am I value betting now? So I think we pretty clearly have like ace, king of diamonds. Uh, we probably have uh, ace, uh, ace, king of spades. Um, you know, how many, how many hands would we have bet on the turn? Now, if we're using a small sizing and we bet that we can bet the turn wider, so maybe we have uh, more hands like Jack-10, uh, Queen-10. So I would say probably the ideal case would be we just don't bluff with our uh, diamond hands as much. Um, maybe we do have some showdown value with our ace high. It's not going to be very much. Um, you know, we could certainly beat Jack 10, I guess, some percentage or 10 8 or something like that. Um, or I guess weaker, a, a weak line from like a queen jack of spades or something like that. Um, but these are kind of like hands where it's like, yeah, maybe they're folding at some point. It's, it's hard to give them full credit. Um, and also, we have to just think about like, okay, like I guess we have nines, we have ace king, we have aces. And so basically, we're in a situation where I think our value. A betting range becomes very tight like i don't think we're betting queens here um for value too much uh it's not super desirable uh, we'd be betting small and folding to raises and it gets a little weird so i'd rather just have at this point having taken the line we've taken just have like an over bet size for all in and um yeah and just you know value better clear cut you know ace king plus type hands and uh, uh and then some bluffs and so is this is this a hand that we want to bluff with? It's real tricky because the perception is, I think, that maybe we have like potentially some some wider range hands here. You know, our, our opponent could give us credit for having ten eight. We really shouldn't, um, in my opinion, have ten eight here ever. And uh, because of that, it's like we kind of blocking diamonds isn't great. But is it better than the alternatives? Like, have we left open enough of their jack ten combos? that they might just continue with or things like that. Basically, 
I don't know. It's hard. It's going to be hard to do this analysis real quick in the moment. So what's a nice defensible way to do it? Well, let's, let's bluff some percentage of the time. And uh, I think RNG wise, you know, I could think you could safely say like, I don't know, let's, let's bluff 15% uh, of the time here. I don't, I don't think that's indefensible. Um, can we come up with better combos that we definitely want to bet the turn on? Not really. So yeah, uh, I think having an overbet bluff here uh, with some of our hands that got here uh, might just be the easiest way to do it. Just like, okay, I'm going to take 15% of the hands I would have gotten here on the river and uh, we'll, we'll overbet bluff those and you know, then just better value hands. And that's that <laughs> it's a, it's a complicated scenario and, and we have to simplify in the moment. Um, we'd have to know exactly what our turn bluff range is to come up with the, the perfect combos. And, you know, we unblock some nice things here with the, with the ACE five diamonds. So yeah, seems okay. Yep. Totally fair. Yeah. I think the overbet as played in the turn with that turn sizing, I'm much more on board with if we had overbet the turn and gotten called, I don't think I can find a punch in this situation. I just don't, I don't think anything's folding because they're going to be getting such a good price against the, any shove that we make on the river. You kind of in agreement with that? Yeah, it's, it's definitely not an, an, a exploitatively appealing bluff. Um, I think I would probably just defensively make, make the bluff the way I, I tend to, and just be like, well, <laughs> when I get stacked, I get stacked. And sure. most of the time I'm checking here anyways, and that's fine. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's, it's not a super appealing bluff, even though it actually, it kind of looks like a good bluff card. I think that's almost part of the problem with it. Like you said, um, it's almost impossible. I think to say what our opponents are going to do here exactly, which is why I lean on having some percentage of the bluffs just so I'm protected in case they overfold. Um, and I'm leaning it down because I don't think I want to be bluffing a ton. So yeah, that makes total sense. Excellent. Well, I guess at this point we've kind of run this one a ton. So unfortunately we end up getting called. Our opponent has threes and what a uh, not unfortunate situation for hero. But this is one of those where let's just say that our opponent had folded. This is still a very, very interesting hand to explore. So don't just explore this hand, you know, hero in this exact spot or you in general. Don't just explore a hand like this because you lost it actually explore and be like, well, what should I be doing at every single step of the way? And this is a very, very interesting one from hero's point of view, from early positions point of view. I mean, well, having a boat is always nice in a three bet pot. So congratulations, <laughs> you win a stack. And, and you know, like they really shouldn't have three hand, hands like threes here, but we have to account for that when we're doing analysis of this type of things. Like they could have had a hand like nine, seven as well. They could have had a hand like seven, five, which is something that probably shouldn't be in their range. They could have something like seven, four when they min rise like this. And sure. um, yeah, I think that's why it's so nice. And this is me going to my GTO pitch. It's so nice to have a balanced range because it's like, do you think I'd be sweating if I got called by threes here and I and I shoved 15% of the time? I would not be in case that wasn't clear. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, but at the same time, if like imagine that they were folding queens and tens and things like that, 100% on the river, because like, ah, oh, he's got aces, screw it. Um, you want to be the person who never bluffed. No, I don't want to be that person. So um, we actually didn't really, you know, we got to see the results here, but we didn't really learn that much other than, you know, we do have to count for hands that our opponents can have that are outside uh, the normal ranges. And, um, but similarly, like, you know, like that tells us they could probably be folding on that river a lot too, right? That they have threes here. Like what other, you know, what other hands they could have versus our line? I, I don't think it even shows our line was necessarily bad. Um, right. And yeah, so you always, you can't really rely on the results in 2021. You gotta, gotta know your frequencies and your ranges and, and what your approach is. So. Yeah. The, the one bit of information, I don't really glean too, too much from post-flop play from villain in this spot, but in terms of pre-flop, then my question is, cause they did min raise from under the gun in this situation. So I'm paying a lot of attention to them and seeing if they have multiple raise sizes from under the gun or from middle position and seeing if those smaller sizes are correlated with more of these kind of drawing set miney kind of hands and the bigger size could mean something different not saying that they do for sure but it'd definitely be a note that i take and i'm looking for confirmation over the next session or so for sure great yeah 
Excellent. Awesome. So this was a fun one. Chris, thank you so much for hanging out and talking with me about it today. If you have your own hand or question, you can always pop it in our Discord, redchippoker.com slash Discord. Join for free today, and we'll see you in there. Otherwise, we'll see you back shortly with a brand new video. And in the meantime, good luck out there, and happy grinding.